everyone. Welcome back to my PhD vlogs. If you don't already know me, my name is Morgan. I'm doing my PhD in theater and performance studies in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And this is just a series where I take you into my life as I complete that process. I I'm hoping to be done this year. The goal that I set for myself back in September was to defend by the end of August, 2024. I don't know for sure if I'm gonna make that. I did look this week at the sort of loose timeline I had set for myself to achieve that 2024 August deadline. And I'm not too far off. Today is February 17th. And I had said that on February 15th, I wanted to send something fully formed, doesn't have to be the whole dissertation, but something to my committee. And I haven't done that, but I do have a fully formed first chapter. There's just a couple edits that I still wanna make and I already know what they are. So I'm not too far off of being able to achieve that goal. I do wanna check in first with my supervisor and make sure that's still the goal that we want to achieve. But as far as like the timeline of completing things goes, it's not looking horrible. That said, today is a Saturday and this week, Monday through Friday, I did nothing on my PhD. I was having too poor of a mental health week for me to engage in my PhD work. And unfortunately, that's just sort of the nature of the PhD for me. I'm sure for some people, the PhD is like a cozy, comfy project that they get to work on and that they love to like dive into when they're having a poor mental health week. For me, that's not the case. I need to be doing quite well in my own head, in my own life, for me to feel confident, engaged, Engaging in my PhD and to actually get productive work done on it. And unfortunately, this week was not that week for me. After my second video in this series, some people in the comments said that it's hard to see me that sad or down, and I didn't feel like I was that sad or down in that video, but I guess that's the nature of a vlog. That's kind of the point, is to actually bring you in to what I'm actually doing week to week and day to day, and how it feels for me to be engaging in the process of completing my PhD, and it's gonna be different for everyone. At times for me, doing the PhD feels like flow state. It feels like optimal experience, like when I get really into the, the thinking and the writing, like I really sort of immerse myself in it and that feels so good and other times it doesn't. And this week I didn't even feel up to working on my PhD. There was too much else on my mind for me to do it. But today, Saturday, I'm going to have hopefully a lazy but productive day. And I have been planning on today to be a productive day because I don't have plans and I decided I wasn't gonna make plans. I was just going to dedicate today to myself and hopefully to my PhD. This week, as I was not doing my PhD work and not doing my PhD work, and I don't regret not doing my PhD work, I really don't think that the work that I would have done this week would have been good and I think it would have made me feel worse in general, um, but I started to have that feeling of like, oh, it's it's okay because Saturday I am gonna get a ton of work done. I'm gonna make up for this whole week. But I think that's a dangerous thought to fall into because then if Saturday isn't a productive enough work day, enough, if I'm not good enough on Saturday to have accomplished everything that I might have accomplished in a week, in a different week, then I would just feel more disappointed in myself. So I'm not setting myself any goals today if I, I'm not ready to work on the PhD, I'm not going to, but here is what the plan is. First of all, I went to a local cafe and I got myself a decaf Americano because I'm trying to drink more decaf and I know that especially when I'm not feeling as sort of mentally healthy and strong, drinking things like caffeine or alcohol or eating junk food is not gonna help that state. So I got a decaf Americano and then I'm immediately gonna contradict myself because I got myself a double chocolate salted caramel cookie. So let's give this a whirl. That's a pretty good cookie and that's too hot to drink. So I've got my tasty cozy weekend snacks. I think I'm gonna play a little bit of Don't Starve, which is a Nintendo Switch game that I've been very into lately. It's a survival game, and I think I just really love survival games because I 
love Valheim and I love Zelda Breath of the Wild. I haven't played the second Zelda yet, but I'm sure I'm gonna love it too. So I'm gonna give myself that treat of eating my cookie and drinking my coffee and playing Don't Starve so that I can kind of like get myself into a happy, positive place at the beginning of this day. Anyway, something that I'll often do when I'm feeling down and I want to stop feeling down and I maybe don't necessarily know how is I'll go out and I'll go to a bookstore first of all because that always makes me feel better. Just seeing all of the thoughts in the world that people have been considerate enough to write down into these beautiful objects um, makes me so happy and fulfilled. And then what I'll do is I'll go and purchase um, a self-help book. I love self-help. It's one of my favorite genres. So earlier this week, I went to the bookstore and I specifically went to purchase Chatter by Ethan Cross because I heard about it a while ago and it sounded like a book that would help me specifically in my personal struggles. The subtitle is The Voice in Our Head, Why It Matters and How to Harness It. So I hope that it's going to help me avoid any negative thought spirals and start telling myself loving things in my head to sort of support myself through those difficult times. And then the other one that I saw while I was there that I have heard about and been recommended in the past but wasn't planning on picking up is The Comfort Book by Matt Haig. I've never read Matt Haig's fiction. Um, one of my best friends in the world, she has a tattoo of one of his books on her body because she loves him so much. And I know people love The Midnight Library. I've never read anything by him, but I've been recommended this one. It's a nonfiction. It's more self-helpy. It's little bite-sized, like supportive, calming um, bits. Like for instance, this page just says short and then it says life is short, be kind. So it's just little reminders, I think, for life to make you feel comfort. And that sounded like exactly what I needed this week. So after I play some video games, I might read a little bit of the comfort book or chatter. And then what I think I wanna do is read a bit of an academic book. Last week, I had a phone call with someone who was a peer of mine in my undergrad and who is now also working on their PhD in a similar field to me. And there's some overlap between our projects. And so we had a phone call to chat about our projects and update each other on our lives. And they recommended a number of books to me, which were so helpful. And I'm so glad that we connected because they have a lot of like articles and books and stuff for a specific chapter of mine that overlaps with a chapter of theirs. But the one specifically that I wanted to buy immediately is from the Theater and series. And the book specifically is Theater and Time. That book was a lot cheaper on Kobo. And so I purchased it for Kobo. So today I need to actually put the book on my Kobo and I think I'll start reading it. It's a very short book, so I'm hopeful I could get through a good chunk of it. I think it's gonna be like an overview book, almost like a long literature review for other texts and ways of thinking about theater and time over the years, which I think is really gonna help prime me for writing my third chapter. And my third chapter is the chapter that like I've thought the least about and I decided I was going to do for sure the latest. And so I feel less prepared in advance to write it. And I hope this book is going to prepare me. So that's what I want to do today. I'm not so confident I will actually get writing done, but if I can get a good chunk of this book read, I think that I will be more confident to do writing in the coming week. So that's my plan for today. One thing that I wanted to just riff on is this idea that I'm about to go play some video games. And I watched Ali Abdal's recent video. He's got like 200 recent videos, but in one of them, he was saying that he made a decision while he was in med school to never watch TV when he was alone. So he could only watch TV if he was with friends, but even then it sounds like he didn't watch that much. It was like only watching Game of Thrones and he would get everyone together and watch Game of Thrones and that was kind of it. And he said that might be kind of controversial is like, if you want more time in your life, if you want to reach your goals, if you want to like do personal projects on top of a nine to five job or whatever school, cut out TV. It's an option and I totally understand that. It totally would buy back a lot of time. And for some people, TV is like not important enough um, or it's actually frivolous or it actually like drains their mental health and their energy. 
and that's a good thing to just cut it out. For me, cutting out TV, movies, video games, um, and that kind of media feels like less of an option because first of all, I am in a theater degree. I love storytelling. Each of those mediums really teaches me more about the field that I'm in. Video games especially, because in a video game, as with theater, the audience is such an integral part of it. The audience has to be there engaging with it for the art to exist. And so there's a lot of overlap between the storytelling, I think, in video games and in theater and what's possible. And then of course there's a lot of overlap between theater and movies, as well as theater and TV, and the Oscars are coming up, so I'm watching a lot of movies right now. Not a lot of TV, but like Succession was my favorite thing I've ever seen, you know? I don't want to give up immersing myself in that quality of storytelling, regardless of the medium, if it's video games, TV, movies, books, board games, role-playing games, like all of that interests me, and I learn a lot from each of those mediums. So it's a lot, and it does mean that I read less than I would like to. It means that I play less video games than I would like to because I'm spreading that um, storytelling downtime across a wide variety of mediums, but I can't see giving any one of them up. They each offer something unique and special and there are such incredible books, movies, TVs, video games, and like I wouldn't want to miss out on any one of them. If you're ever like getting down on yourself for watching too much TV or playing too many video games, you know, do it intentionally. Do it to learn something. Do it to calm your brain. Do it to just like see the scope of the beauty that people create. You don't have to feel bad about those things. Obviously, like if you're doing it just to avoid your PhD work, maybe try to snap out of that. But if you actually get something out of these mediums, like don't let other people tell you that it's not worthwhile or it's a waste of time. I don't think it is a waste of time if you're actually present and engaging and enjoying it. With that said, I'm gonna go play some Don't Starve and eat my cookie and drink my coffee and I will update you in a bit. No is a good word. It keeps you sane. In an age of overload, no is really yes. It is yes to having the space you need to live. On Saturday, it took me about 50 pages of reading Matt Haig's The Comfort Book before I felt mentally prepared to get back into PhD work after a really difficult week, but I did start reading my book Theatre and Time. I got about a third of the way through the book on Saturday, and it's not exactly what I expected it to be so far, although I'm hoping that it becomes more helpful in the second half. Today is actually now a Tuesday and I'm continuing to read the book. Although I don't know how helpful it's going to be for my actual dissertation, I am finding the book super interesting and super enjoyable, and I think I will use it in other writing projects. In fact, today while I was reading, I actually had to stop reading and write down an idea for a blog post because I was so inspired by this book. So the part that I was reading about was about kind of time as like a macro concept of how you could organize theater viewing. So like we do pantomimes in the winter, for instance, or we do festival season in the summer because that's when all the tourists are in town and how it might be different to watch a show in an afternoon versus an evening and what shows you might want to watch in the evening versus the afternoon or perhaps even the morning um, based on like our own like bodily rhythms, our circadian rhythms. The next second's gonna go into that more micro rhythms of the body. So I'm really excited to read that. Ultimately, like, I think that the book that I was looking for would be more called Performance and Time, but maybe in the second half of this book it's gonna go more into the ontology of theater as a temporal medium and what theatrical time is and where we see theatrical time in other aspects of the world, but so far um, it really is just like tight to the idea of like 
theater shows. For instance, constructs of time within the storytelling of theater and when theater happens. It hasn't even really touched on yet concepts of time or rhythm within acting theories, but I do think that it's going to get there, so I'm excited to keep on reading. It's a couple days later, and I finished the book Theater and Time by David Wiles. It was really good throughout. So concise, so introductory, um, so easy and fun to read. After reading, I synced up my Kobo account with my Readwise and I extracted all of the highlights that I made uh, from quotes in the book, and then I just copy and pasted them over into Obsidian. I don't yet know how I am supposed to cite an ebook yet academically in MLA format. If you do this and you have any tips, please let me know. From what I understand, because I don't think there's an easy way to tell people where something is in an ebook, like for instance, the page number of the physical book always remains the same page number, but Kobo, because you can like zoom in and out, the pages are different and I don't think they always track to the pages of the physical book. And so what Readwise gave me was the location. And so can I use that? Can I use the location number? Because it's gonna be the same for any ebook copy you pick up and I'll just specify it's an ebook in my works cited page. Or should I use like the um, chapter and paragraph number within the chapter or something like that so people can actually locate it no matter which version they're reading? Please, if you know the answer to this question, please let me know, please. <laughs> Anyway, for now I've got the location, but I do have the ebook, so if I really need to figure out where in the book this location is, um, I could do that. Anyway, once all of the quotes were in an Obsidian page dedicated to the book Theater and Time, I then started to go through them and tried to see which of these ideas, which of these quotes I wanted to turn into my own knowledge right now. Hopefully, eventually, I will turn all of the quotes into some form of knowledge for myself, some kind of bite-sized piece of information or idea that I can use in the future while still citing Wiles. But um, right now, the priority is my PhD. And honestly, what I do on this channel is probably gonna look a lot different when I'm done my PhD because I will just get to like, explore the Tuttlecaston, whereas right now I do have this big project in mind that I'm always having to keep in the back of my mind as I'm making notes and reading books. But for now, I asked myself which of these quotes are the most interesting to me for the PhD, and so I started turning those into bite-sized notes. Actually, I'll move to the side here and show you. These are the eight notes that I've taken so far. So of these eight notes, the ones that are like directly ideas from the book, there are one, two, three, four, five, six. And then there are two that are like just ideas that spawned off the book, off of the note that was about the book. So basically what that looked like is here is a note from the book called Rhythm is Organic. And this is literally something that Wiles said that rhythm is organic. And I've included the quote where he said it. But then because of this quote and the little note I made out of it, I had secondary ideas that jump off of this specific idea about site swap and juggling, which juggling is the topic of my dissertation. And so of course I'm looking for ideas from Wiles that I can turn into ideas about juggling, which is not at all what Wiles is writing about, but I think a lot of the things he's saying about theater and time could apply to juggling and time. So from that note, rhythm is organic. Um, I came up with the idea that site swap is only rhythmic when performed. And here is that note. You'll see it's a lot shorter. It's just one little atomic idea that was spawned from Wiles's, and I've only drawn out the specific parts of that original quote that are directly relevant to this idea about site swap. And it's so short. My actual idea is like half a sentence, and then the other half of the sentence that was my idea, I actually turned into its own note, which is site swap is never achieved exactly when performed. So I think that that's a really quick, easy case study for like how I am using the Tettelkasten while reading things for my PhD. And I hope that little snippet helped you. But I think I'm gonna end the vlog here. We didn't get a whole lot done in this vlog. I mean, we did read a whole book and then take eight notes about it, so that's pretty good. But considering that was like a week's worth of stuff, um, not great for me. And the book was not a big book. It was like a 70 page book, so quite short. But I mean, if every week all you do is read a book and take eight notes about it, you're gonna get through your PhD eventually. So at least it's something and I'm in a better headspace now than when I started the vlog, but it's always a bit of a roller coaster up and down. So I'm not fooling myself into thinking that 
everything is just like butterflies and rainbows until the end of my PhD now. I know I'm gonna go through hard times again, but I am going to have the things that I learned um, when I do. And I'm also gonna have a few extra mantras from the comfort book when I do. So to end this vlog off, I am going to leave you with one of those mantras from the comfort book, a passage that I particularly loved and have returned to a number of times since I read it. And I'll see you in another video soon, guys. Bye. Happiness occurs when you forget who you're expected to be and what you're expected to do. Happiness is an accident of self-acceptance. It's the warm breeze you feel when you open the door to who you are.